Sometimes a random confluence of disparate events shapes our destiny. On the night of October 24th, 1973, while well, most of us slept unaware, the intersection of two critical domestic and foreign policy crises propelled us to the nuclear brink. As midnight came and went and dawn approached on that fateful night, in what seemed like a reprise of Black Saturday only 13 years earlier, our national state of readiness was moved to DEFCONS 2 and 3. Nuclear missile commanders again strapped themselves in on launching pads. The 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg was preparing to board planes. Polaris submarines, armed with nuclear-tipped warheads, aimed at the Soviet Union, patrolling in the Mediterranean. Three aircraft carriers of our 6th Fleet, carrying dozens of A-4 attack jets, were streaming full speed ahead, steaming very full speed ahead uh, toward Egypt. But whose thumb was on the red button? Now, we were effectively without a functioning chief executive. Well, how did all this happen? October 6, 1973, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, perhaps the most sacred day in the Jewish calendar, a day when Jews seek forgiveness for a myriad of sins. Among those enumerated in the prayer book is arrogance. The Greeks had a word for it, hubris. Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State at the time, was fond of a Greek admonition. The gods are offended by hubris. The commission of this sin by Israel in 1973 almost spelled the doom of that fledgling nation. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31, prophet Isaiah countenanced the children of Israel, quote, they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles, end quote. Had the faithful in Israel mounted the wings of eagles that Friday afternoon, October 5th, 1973, as the sun was ushering in the commencement of Yom Kippur, they would have witnessed an astounding scene on the West Bank, the Egyptian side of the, of the Suez Canal. They would have seen hidden in plain sight 100,000 Egyptian troops 1,350 tanks, 2,000 artillery pieces nearby, bridging equipment, and rubber boats were drawn up to the water's edge. Looking down from their eagle's wings at the other side of the canal, the eastern or Israeli side, they would have uh, been struck dumb. For there, along a 100-mile front from Fort Fouad on the shores of the Mediterranean in the north, to the Gulf of Suez in the south, they would have found facing those 100,000 Egyptians and their formidable armor only 450 Israeli soldiers, a mere 44 artillery pieces versus the 2,000 the Egyptians had, and 290 tanks opposing 1,350 tanks. And they were all strung out along the length of the Suez Canal, even the vaunted biblical Joshua didn't face odds anything like these. Had the faithful urged their eagle north to the Golan Heights, the odds were even more daunting, for there also in plain sight were five Arab divisions geared for battle. Astoundingly, uh, they were faced by an Israeli defense force outnumbered eight to one in tanks and even longer odds in infantry, artillery, between the Syrian army and Damascus, 40 miles to the east, were a series of secondary Syrian defense lines. There were none on the Israeli side. Why? In the euphoria which had followed its overwhelming victory over the armies of Syria, Jordan, and Egypt in the Six-Day War, only six years before, Israel had apparently offended Kissinger's Greek gods. The limited Israeli forces arrayed along the east bank of the Suez Canal and on the Golan Heights betrayed a sense of invincibility, so much so that the Israeli general staff was content with an overall ratio in the Arabs' favor of three to one. In the Sinai, Egypt had been humiliated. Anwar Sadat, who had succeeded Gamel Abdel Nasser, found the 1967 defeat by the Israelis intolerable and had struck back at Israel in March. 1969, in what he proclaimed with much fanfare was a war of attrition. 
consisted basically of mas massive artillery bombardments, he was forced to accept a humiliating ceasefire in August 1970, having been beaten back by the Israeli Air Force, the IAF, and the Israeli commando raids. The Israeli High Command was convinced that further retaliation was unlikely. They were wrong. When Sadat had succeeded Nasser, uh, he had vowed to restore his nation's dignity at a cost of a million men, if need be. It was far from finished, and the Soviet Union was now arming and training Sadat's army and commando units with the most modern attack weapons in its arsenal. Uh, both Egypt and Syria had become significant Cold War assets for the Soviets. Why not? They not only provided port facilities on the Mediterranean, there were landing rights for reconnaissance planes, bases for electronic monitoring uh, to keep track of the American Sixth Fleet, which was armed, incidentally, with nuclear weapons capable of reaching the Soviet Union. As Egypt prepared to attack Israel that October, the stage was therefore set for a major confrontation between the superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union. But back in Washington, as the Egyptians were poised, ready to attack, across the water that October 6th, our chief executive was under an attack that would eventually prove fatal to his presidency. Watergate Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox and the Senate Watergate Committee Chairman Sam Irvin had subpoenaed the Watergate tapes, which had just been revealed only two months earlier. The testimony of a former presidential appointment secretary, Alexander Butterfield. Nixon, forestalling the inevitable, had refused to honor the subpoenas, as well as a subsequent order from Judge Sirica, compounding Nixon's flight. Within four days, Vice President Agnew would resign in disgrace to avoid prosecution for bribery. Only two months earlier, in August 1973, just as Cox and Irvin petitioned the Supreme Court to order the president to surrender the Watergate tapes, a Soviet ocean liner docked in Alexandria on its regular run from the Syrian port of Latakia. Discharged two men, dressed in civilian suits, but of domestic, distinctly military bearing. They were met by Egyptian Chief of Staff Saad El Shazli, also dressed in civilian garb, escorted quietly through customs and quickly and unseen on to the officers' club in Alexandria. In intensive meetings over the next two days, they would plan a coordinated attack on Israel over the Suez Canal in the south and the Golan Heights in the north. Only the date of the attack was left open. The date of October 6th would eventually be chosen for a number of reasons. It was not only the Day of Atonement, it was also the evening during which the moon was scheduled to shine only until midnight, thus enabling the Egyptians to hide their crossing bridges in total darkness. Moreover, October 6th would provide a minimal difference between high and low tides, which would facilitate bridge building. But there was one strategic difference between the two military contingents late that August. Syria insisted that Egypt drive deep into the Sinai to divert Israel's strength from the Golan. But Sadat and the Egyptian high command planned only a limited crossing to secure and hold a small defensible corridor on the Israeli East Bank. The objective was to hold it as a bargaining ship in negotiating a favorable peace treaty with Israel to regain land lost in the Six Day War, but most importantly, to restore Egypt's shattered self-esteem. As plans for the simultaneous attacks, both foreign and domestic, began to coalesce, a perfect storm was gathering, one which would call to the forefront America's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, who had just been sworn in a month earlier, although as Nixon's National Security Advisor, as you know, he was already an indispensable cog in the administration. Born in 1923 to a school teacher and his wife in Firth, Germany, Henry, born Heinz Kissinger, had with his family escaped Hitler's grasp, immigrated to the United States in 1938, 
where he was naturalized in 1943 while serving uh, in the U.S. military in Europe. Unlike his brother Walter, Kissinger never lost his heavy Bavarian accent. In 2004, he joked to a military historian uh, named Alistair Horn, my brother Walter learned American as a street vendor, but I kept my accent because I went to Harvard. <laughs> but Kissinger had retained more than an accent from his European roots. While at Harvard, after an undergraduate fascination with historical philosophy of Arnold Toynbee, the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant, the historical darkness and the melancholy of Oswald Spengler and the decline of the West, Kissinger became captivated with 19th century European leaders, Prince Clemens von Metternich, Otto von Bismarck, and Robert Stuart Viscount Castlereagh. We considered masters of the art of Royale politique. Became a conservative, an admirer of these denizens of diplomacy who had followed a strategy devoid of moral homilies and succeeded in maintaining a relatively peaceful balance of power in Europe during a significant part of the 19th century. That's after Napoleon in 1815, with the exception of the Franco-Prussian War, which was essentially uh, a skirmish. Kissinger harbored a visceral fear of revolution. Uh, they upset the so social order. He had, after all, been victimized by revolutionary upheaval in the fall of, Weim of the Weimar Republic. And he came to equate the potential alternative to status quoism in the 20th century with nuclear warfare. Kissinger, whose introduction to the Washington scene had been as a foreign policy advisor to Nelson Rockefeller, a liberal Republican, initially regarded Nixon from afar as a hollow man and evil. Ironically, he was even dismayed uh, by Nixon's nomination in 1968. Although he'd been in furtive contact uh, with Nixon's campaign aide, Bryce Harlow, during the last months of the campaign against Humphrey, imparting to Harlow intelligence on the Paris uh, peace negotiations with the Vietnamese. He was both stunned and skeptical when Nixon, soon after his election, asked him to become his national security advisor. Upon meeting Nixon, however, Kissinger was astonished, astonished by Nixon's penetrating mind. He was pleasantly surprised to discover that Nixon had not only read and absorbed Kissinger's articles in foreign affairs and his books, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy and A World Restored, but that Nixon was at one with Kissinger's Metternichian approach to the Soviet Union and to China. It was a transformational approach, in short, to persuade Moscow and Beijing to no longer regard themselves as revolutionary expansionist powers but as status quo powers. Ever since Potsdam in 1945, the US had generally followed a policy of aggressive containment of the Soviet Union. Under Nixon Kissinger, that would continue, but there would come a subtle but incremental change. This gradually evolving approach would seek to contain, but nonetheless impose legitimacy on systems such as those of the USSR and China, which considered themselves revolutionary. And it would do so by convincing them that they had much more to gain from commercial behavior, which their ailing economies needed, than from aggressive behavior as the eternal revolutionaries. It was a principle which would shortly lead us to detente with the Soviets, open up China, both Nixon and Kissinger had a penchant for back-channel communications and diplomacy, and that too fit the Metternichian mold perfectly. But Nixon and Kissinger were by background diametric opposites. James Reston once quipped, quote, Richard Nixon inherited good instincts from his Quaker forebears, but by diligent hard work he overcame them. Henry Kissinger had no such forebears. But now the California son of a Quaker mother and a failed grocer father, the Jewish refugee son of a Hebrew school teacher from Nazi Germany, in Washington Heights, New York, would become kindred spirits. An odd couple bound together as no two other figures in that ill-fated administration. 
Kissinger was to become Nixon's alter ego, his closest surrogate, despite the jealousies. During the crises that would follow in the fall of 1973, however, as Watergate closed in on Nixon, and until Nixon's resignation in August 1974, Kissinger would become the glue holding the administration together, and some have speculated for a time, the most powerful figure on the globe. A number of Metternich's uh, lessons in practical diplomacy were to serve as cornerstones of Kissinger's policy during the harrowing days that followed that fateful Yom Kippur in October 1973. One of those Metternichian maxims was that to succeed completely is to invite disintegration. To succeed completely is to invite disintegration. Kissinger felt that Israel's total humiliation of Egypt in the 1967 war had invited the disintegration of Nasser's regime so that when Sadat succeeded him, retaliation was inevitable. Kissinger's guiding light during the crisis that followed then was to assure that Israel survived, but also that Egypt was not crushed in the process. The same held true with regard to Brezhnev. Kissinger's grand design, as always in detente, was to contain the Soviets, in this instance in the Middle East. But it was also not to so humiliate them as to detract from the legitimacy of the Soviet regime. Which brings me to the story of Captain Moti Ashkenazi and his wonder dog, Pang. <clears throat> Captain Ashkenazi was a 32-year-old doctoral student on philosophy at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was placed in charge of the northernmost outpost on the Barlev line named Budapest. The Barlev line was a series of 41 outposts along the east of the Israeli side of the Suez Canal. It was the ceasefire line demarcated when the 1967 war was called to a halt. Budapest was situated on a sand spit on the Mediterranean guarding the coastal road to Israel. But it was perilously close to an Egyptian stronghold just outside Port Fuad. The Israeli outpost was in a state of disrepair, as were many of the forts along the Barlev line. Ashkenazi's unit, dubbed the Jerusalem Brigade, was definitely second tier militarily, made up mostly of overage recruits, many well into the 30s and 40s, as well as recent immigrants whose training had been truncated. Its placement in such a strategic location was perhaps symptomatic of the misguided complacency of the Israeli high command at the time. Things were so casual that when the unit had been called up, Ashkenazi, who could not find a suitable place for his four-month-old German shepherd dog, Peng, brought the dog along for the Jewish holidays. Upon assuming command, Ashkenazi climbed the observation tower and looked out across the sand spit to the west. He could easily make out an Egyptian outpost only a mile away. Suddenly, a pack of wild dogs emerged from that outpost and trotted east toward Budapest's garbage dump. Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi braced for an explosion as the dogs passed into the Israeli minefield, but none came. Well, tides washing over the sand spit must have neutralized the mines, he thought. He'd contact headquarters the next day and have them replaced. The student of philosophy, a skeptic by both nature and profession, had now become philosophical about Israel's vulnerability. As the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, had grown, a number of generals had their offices redecorated, gave parties with military bands and choruses, background entertainment. All of this was foreign to the Spartan way of life, which had informed the fledgling nation when it was fighting for its life in 1948. The captain def detected not only a spirit of arrogance, but a sense of disdain for Arab military capability. A week before Yom Kippur, while on a routine morning patrol, Ashkenazi spotted footprints in the sand on both sides of the road. The road was shut at night because it was vulnerable to commando landings. 
Whoever made the footprints, thought Ashkenazi, may well have been examining the lay of the land, and in particular, the high ground overlooking the road. Called headquarters who immediately dispatched trackers. The trackers examined the footprints and concluded that they were merely from Israeli army boots. If I were an Egyptian scout, ventured the skeptic Ashkenazi, I'd use that kind of boot. Traders tracked. They laughed, the trackers. You think they're that clever. Why not, replied Ashkenazi. Now, of course, answering a question of a question may be an ethnic thing. The attack came at 2 p.m. on October 6. It was brutal. From the air, over 200 planes bombed and strafed IDF encampments and other bases along the canal. In just the first five minutes, over 10,500 artillery and mortar, mortar rounds fell upon the undermanned Barlev line. The stunned Israeli defenders were driven down into their bunkers, but as they descended, flat trajectory weapons were raised in position atop the Egyptian encampment and began firing at the Israeli forts opposite them. As mortars now continued to lob thousands of shells with thunderous explosions, Israeli lookout towers were blown away, bunkers shuttered, trenches collapsed, loudspeakers set up by the Egyptians on the banks thundered piercing battle cries to incite the troops. Commandos were already paddling across the canal, screened by smoke shells, chanting, Allahu Akbar, God is great. Engineering teams crossed with water hoses began gouging holes in the massive Israeli sand embankments. Within two hours, 60 passageways had been blown open. It got worse. The bulk of the Israeli armor had mistakenly been removed from the banks of the canal, was now located further inland in the Sinai. To compound the problem, the forts along the Barlev line were in the process of being converted to mobile units in an effort to replace the Maginot Line type stationary fortifications uh, with more maneuverable targets. Many of the forts, uh, which were slated to be replaced anyway, were falling into disrepair. By the second evening, October 7th, the Egyptians had landed 100,000 men, over 1,000 tanks, 13,500 vehicles on the Israeli side of the canal. They had destroyed over 150 Israeli tanks, killed 280 men, lost only 20 men in the process. It was a rout. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan had panicked and was now talking about the destruction of the Third Temple. Most of the Israeli outposts still located along the canal were already wiped out. One that wasn't was Budapest. Ashkenazi on top of the Budapest Tower, an observation post, slid down the ladder into a rabbit hole where he could survey the surroundings through a periscope, but he could see nothing. His vision was impaired by smoke. Fearing that the Egyptians might already be advancing, he ran from his position and could see that Egyptian personnel carriers and tanks, jeeps had now emerged from their nearby positions and were heading directly toward the sand spit right at him. He had no defense. Budapest was without anti-tank weapons of any kind. The bazooka shells Marty had asked for were never received. He instinctively climbed to the higher ground, figuring that as a desperate last grasp for his life, possibly lob grenades onto the Egyptian tanks from above and ignite their exposed spare fuel tanks. Miraculously, as if out of nowhere, Two lone Israeli tanks approached from the rear. Their vision was impaired by smoke, but Ashkenazi jumped on board from above and banged hard on the turret with a shovel. When the lids finally opened, Ashkenazi pointed the tank commanders toward the approaching Egyptian tanks. Both Israeli tanks opened fire on the Egyptians simultaneously, and fortunately for Ashkenazi, their fire was pinpoint accurate. Before long, the Egyptian tanks, armored personnel carriers, and trucks were all aflame, and since there was no place for their vehicles to turn around on the narrow sand dune, the few Egyptian personnel who survived the cast iron infernos were soon running in frantic retreat toward Egyptian lines. But their small victory would prove pyrrhic and short-lived. Within days, Budapest would again 
come under attack by Egyptian commandos. And this time the Egyptian commandos would gain the high ground and dig in overlooking the road. Their scouts, whose footprints the skeptic Ashkenazi had correctly diagnosed, had chosen the ambush site well. In the days that follows, Budapest would come under repeated attack because it was in a very strategic location. It would come under attack by Egyptian commando units. But Ashkenazi's makeshift crew remarkably repelled them successfully. They were forewarned of one of the commando raids and saved by Ashkenazi's wonder dog, Peng, who had barked long before the Israeli defenders sensed the Egyptian commando's presence. The German shepherd pup, who couldn't be left behind, had become an instant Jewish hero. On that October 6th, as Captain Ashkenazi was scrambling down the observation tower into a rabbit hole, Henry Kissinger was asleep in another tower, a more luxurious tower on Park Avenue in the heart of New York City. At 6.15 a.m., an agitated assistant secretary, Joseph Sisko, barged into Kissinger's suite at the Waldorf Towers, breathlessly announced that Egypt and Syria were about to invade Israel. Been warned of this by U.S. Ambassador Kenneth Keating, who'd been summoned urgently to go to Meir's office that morning. We may be in trouble, she had said. It was a gross understatement. Cisco was confident that Kissinger, who was hardly at awake, could defuse the situation before the shooting began. He was naively um, optimistic. Kissinger, as soon as he was awake, immediately launched into a series of telephone calls, the first of which was to his old friend, the Soviet ambassador, Anatoly Dobrynin. Amidst the mounting tension, it was not without its humorous side. After telling Dobrynin what he had learned from Sisko, Kissinger told his old friend, we are urgently communicating to the Israelis. Dobrynin, you? Kissinger, yes. Dobrynin, communicating to the Israelis? Kissinger, if this keeps up, there's going to be a war before you understand my message. Kissinger followed with an unrelenting barrage of calls to the Egyptian foreign minister, Mohammed el Zayat, among others. And as much as we did not have diplomatic relations with Egypt, Zayat was Kissinger's Metternichian back channel communication to Cairo. He assured Zayat that uh, we had um, warned the Israelis not to attack, something Zayat, of course, a new full well. Then came rapid fire calls in succession to Israel's foreign minister, Abba Iban, Israeli ambassador Shalev, um, and at 8.35 a.m. to chief of staff Alexander Hay, who was with the president in Key Biscayne. Significantly, Kissinger urged Haig to inform the media that Nixon had been kept in the loop from 6 o'clock a.m. on. Kissinger didn't actually call the president until 9.25 a.m., three hours after Cisco had barged into his room at the Waldorf Towers. When Haig called to advise that Nixon was considering returning to Washington, Kissinger discouraged the president's return, urging Haig to keep Nixon's Walter Mitty tendencies under control. At 2.30 p.m., Kissinger then took it upon himself to order the Sixth Fleet to proceed full steam toward the Eastern Mediterranean. Nixon had not yet been consulted about that. The Secretary of State, not the President, had essentially assumed military command. Significantly, from the outset of the crisis, Kissinger, not Nixon, was in complete command. Nixon had escaped from Washington to Key Biscayne. He was hiding out from Watergate and the impending Agnew resignation in the company of his shadowy, sphinx-like friends, Bibi Rebozo and Robert Aplanap. Perfectly willing to let Kissinger handle the crisis, give him a free hand, but Nixon's concern principally was with being seen by the public as being in command. Kissinger was willing to abet this public charade. He's concerned only that Nixon, in his attempt to divert the attention of the public from Watergate and to focus it on his own indispensability, would say something to the public which might disrupt Kissinger's ability to communicate through back channels such as Dobrynin and Zayat. Then, just as suddenly, on October 11th, five days into the war, 
things changed dramatically. The Israelis hit back hard at the Syrians in the north. In tank battles similar in scope to those in World War II, the Israeli Defense Force regained the initiative. Their mobility and their training trumped that of the lumbering Soviet-style command system. And they had logistics on their side. When the tide of battle turned in the north, the Israelis were able to rush their armored columns south of Sinai overnight. It's not that far. At Kissinger and Nixon's direction, over the strong objection of Defense Secretary James Schlesinger, Maverick anti-tank missiles had just flown in from the U.S. and were wreaking havoc on Syrian and Egyptian tanks. They were a significant factor in changing the tide of the battle. In the north, with the aid of the Mavericks, the IDF had recovered its equilibrium, broken out of the Golan Heights, and had raced to within 20 miles of Damascus, inflicting devastating losses on Syrian tank columns. The Egyptian and Syrian tanks were now unraveling in tandem. In the Sinai on October 14th, Sadat blundered. Over the objection of many on his general staff, he abandoned the original well-thought-out plan to establish a limited perimeter on the east bank of the Suez and then negotiate from strength. He now commanded his elite Third Army to break out of the 25-mile corridor on the Israeli side of the canal and advance rapidly toward the Gidi and Mitla passes, which had been of strategic importance during the Six-Day War. Now, at first, it was going well, almost too well. Kissinger, an astute military tactician, guessed that the Israeli military were luring the Egyptian Third Army into a position outside the range of Egyptian SAM missiles. Those are anti-aircraft missiles, very, very effective. He was right. The Egyptians had blundered into a balaclava trap, not unlikely, not unlike that which annihilated the British Light Brigade during the Crimean War in an action immortalized in Rudyard Kipling's stirring poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. In a bloodbath, the Israeli Defense Force, now un <clears throat> unhindered by SAMs, destroyed 250 of the 333rd Army tanks heading toward the passes. And the remaining 80 never made it back to the west bank of the Suez. In his briefings to Nixon, however, Kissinger was now thinking far beyond the immediate battle lines to the ultimate ceasefire lines, and more importantly, to the residue of Soviet influence over its Middle Eastern clients. What happened next would severely test his adherence to the principles of Metternich. The Egyptians now unwittingly created a vacuum between their second and third armies. Ironically, it was a vacuum not unlike that exploited by Adolf Hitler's General von Manstein during the Nazi Blitzkrieg in France in May 1940. At that time, the French Second and Ninth Armies each thought the other was guarding its flank. Von Manstein's panzers were rushed into the gap between them on the Meuse River. His adroit maneuver gave the Wehrmacht the option of heading straight for Paris or rushing north to entrap the entire British expeditionary force. They chose the latter option, and before long, Generals Rommel and von Rundstedt had advanced all the way to the shore of the English Channel and were overlooking the Channel escape port of Dunkirk. A handsome, impetuous, young, blonde Israeli commander had been forced into retirement for defying orders in the 1967 war. But he was now recalled in the emergency placed at the head of a reserved armored brigade. Ariel Sharon was in many respects an Israeli reincarnation of U.S. General George Patton. He was a student of military history, headstrong, offense-minded, continually thinking outside the box and willing to take chances. Sharon was always out front of his men in battle, and he resented and often disobeyed armchair strategists who stayed behind the front lines. He was, in short, like General Patton, a military commander's worst nightmare. Moreover, the high command feared that he was not only a self-promoter, but hungry for political power. So they tried their best to suppress him 
On October 8th, Sharon spotted a scene between the Egyptian second and third armies. He requested that the high command allow him to cross the canal between the two armies and envelop the Egyptians from behind. This would give the Israelis the option of swinging north to trap the Egyptian second army or south to trap the third army, which was now strung out all the way to the Gidi and Mitla Passes on the Israeli side of the canal. The latter was the option they eventually chose after two agonizing days of argument, during which Sharon and the venerable General Barlev almost came to physical blows. They had to be separated. The perilous crossing would be dubbed valiant men, but Sharon, like the biblical Moses, was not allowed to cross. He was ordered to stay behind on the Israeli shore and provide cover. During the fierce fighting that followed, the cumbersome roller bridge intended for the crossings broke while the bridge was being towed over the dunes. And the plan was on the verge of being abandoned by the commanders in the field. But true to form, the impetuous Sharon, not content to be Moses left behind in the wilderness, improvised. He again disobeyed orders, strung together a series of 15 raft pontoons, which were called gillaways, constructed from junkyard leftovers. Under heavy fire, Sharon now commanded his men to cross on these and entirely in character, he himself was in the first raft. There was still no bridge, but the gillaways which made it over were remarkably sturdy enough to ferry tanks across until a foothold could be established. The general staff's reservations about Sharon were entirely justified. The crossing against orders would make him something of a legend in Israel, a modern day Joshua eventually prime minister. In assessing their chances before the operations, Chief of Staff Dato el had perhaps summed it up best. If the history of how we pulled this off is ever known, it will be seen as the height of chutzpah. But the remarkable turnaround would ironically prove to be an even greater test of Kissinger's diplomatic brinkmanship. In Washington, Watergate matters were now moving precipitously toward a decisive confrontation. And Nixon would alternatively become suddenly distracted and then remarkably cogent during the strategy sessions with Kissinger. Gerald Ford had been nominated by Nixon to replace Agnew, but had not yet been confirmed by the Senate. That would not happen until December 6th. We are now in October. Nixon's resignation at this juncture would have made Carl Albert President, who was then Speaker of the House, an outcome that had horrified both Kissinger and Haig. Diplomatic, in diplomatic terms, we were at a turning point. By October 18th, the tide of battle in the Sinai had turned so decisively that 300 Israeli tanks had crossed to the Egyptian side of the canal and the IDF was now on the way to entrapping and annihilating the entire Egyptian Third Army, 25,000 strong, which was now almost hopelessly surrounded on the Israeli side of the canal. If a ceasefire were not put in place immediately, only Soviet military intervention could rescue it. Israel, the U.S. ally in the region, not only held the upper hand, could now, if it wished, threaten Cairo while the Egyptian Third Army was trapped and helpless. Ominously, Kissinger was now advised by Alexander Haig that the Soviets had already alerted three airborne paratroop divisions in Europe. On October 19th, just as Nixon proposed as a futile Watergate compromise that Senator John Stennis, a Democrat from Mississippi, be permitted to prepare a summary of the tapes for the Watergate Committee, Kissinger received an important call from Dobrynin with an urgent message from Brezhnev for Nixon. It requested that the president's closest associate, Dr. Kissinger, come to Moscow in an urgent manner, meaning tomorrow, October 20th, to conduct appropriate negotiations. And it went on, not only every day, but every hour counts. It was clear to Kissinger that Moscow was in a state of near panic over its rapidly declining position in the Middle East. Egypt, the dependent it had trained and supplied, was in dire straits. 
But the IDF wanted more time to complete the cutoff by capturing Suez, the only port through which the Third Army could be supplied. Could the meeting instead be shifted to Washington? Uh, Kissinger asked. No, replied Dobrynin. It was imperative that the triumvirate of Gromyko, Kosygin, and Brezhnev all be present. It was that vital. After dinner, in his honor, <clears throat> the previous night, Kissinger left for Moscow the next morning on October 20th. The next day in Moscow, the desperate Kremlin triumvirate adopted Kissinger's proposed ceasefire virtually unchanged in a record period of four hours. Negotiators agreed that the ceasefire would be incorporated into a United Nations resolution to go into effect 12 hours after the resolution was adopted, and that it would be a ceasefire in place. This gave the Israelis at least another 28 hours. The Security Council passed the resolution at 12.50 a.m. New York time on October 22. But the wording was such that the ceasefire line itself was a moving target. Ironically, at one point, Kissinger speaking to Haig from Moscow on Saturday night, Washington time, had expressed irritation at Haig's complaint that he had troubles of his own back in Washington. What troubles can you possibly have in Washington on a Saturday night? Asked Kissinger, but as Kissinger was negotiating from a position of strength, Moscow, the administration's weakness back home, was metastasizing. Art Buckwald once said of Nixon, I worship the quicksand he walks on. <laughs> While Kissinger was in Moscow, Nixon was now sinking quiet quickly into that quicksand. Attorneys General Ruckelshaus and then Ruck, uh, and um, Richardson had both resigned after refusing uh, to fire Watergate Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox, whose apparent sin was that he had rejected Nixon's long shot Stennis compromise proposal. Judge Robert Bork had been deputized Attorney General, dutifully fired Cox. That was Saturday night. A shocked nation, still without a confirmed vice president, awakened the morning after the so-called Saturday Night Massacre to rumblings of impeachment. Kissinger now realized it was imperative to end the war before the Soviets were able to take advantage of our burgeoning domestic nightmare. While he was in Moscow, Kissinger received an invitation from Golda Meir to visit Israel on his way back to New York but not as a Jewish pilgrim. Kissinger's emotional attachment to Israel was ambiguous at best. He was conflicted. As a Harvard freshman in 1948, he had opposed Israel's creation, arguing that it would alienate the Arabs and jeopardize U.S. interests. At one point, he would undercut Patrick Moynihan and the Jackson-Granick Amendment, which you may recall tied most favored nation trading st status with the Soviets to allowing the so-called Jewish refuseniks to emigrate. That was something Kissinger opposed. Nonetheless, he described the visit to Israel as one of the most emotional of his diplomatic career. It was also the occasion of a momentous blunder by the shrewd diplomat, one which would bring us to the brink of a nuclear war. When he arrived in Israel on Monday, October 22, Kissinger was greeted by the Israeli populace with tears in their eyes. The nation was at the breaking point. Their, wor their weariness, said Kissinger, almost tangibly conveyed the limits of human exhaustion. While they had won the battle, they had lost the aura of invincibility. It is, of course, manifest that if Israel loses only one war, it will be their last. But Israel was woefully unprepared for this one. Unacceptable mistakes had been made. Although Israel had survived the leaders with whom Israel Kissinger would, be, would meet in Israel, principally Golda Meir, Chief of Staff, Dato El Azar, and Defense Minister Moshe Dayan would all be gone within a year. While Kissinger was in Israel, word came that the Egyptians had accepted the terms of the ceasefire. 12 hours after the resolution was passed. It would now have been 6.52 p.m. Israeli time. 
The Egyptian Third Army was now cut off except for one secondary supply route in the extreme south. The IDF was pleading for just two or three days more. In his book, Years of Upheaval, Kissinger admits that he was suffering from exhaustion at the time and had stated to Golda Meir that he would understand if there were a few hours of slippage in the ceasefire deadline while he was flying home. Other historians working from interviews as well as tape material released many years later have concluded that he was far more explicit with the Israelis, indicating that nothing would happen while he was in flight to the United States. Irrespective of the specificity, this gaffe almost proved disastrous. After stopping in Heathrow to brief the British, Kissinger didn't land in Washington until 3 a.m. on October 23rd. Barely fallen asleep when he was rudely awakened at 9 a.m. by messages from Egyptian Foreign Minister Ismail complaining bitterly that the Israelis had broken the ceasefire. This was followed rapidly by messages from Secretary General Kurt Waldheim of the UN to the same effect, coupled with demands that the U.S. secure Israeli compliance. Golda Meir insisted that the activity and breach of the ceasefire was initiated by the Egyptians. Kissinger felt that scenario was highly unlikely. Unlikely as the Egyptian Third Army at the hour appointed for the ceasefire could still have been supplied through the Gulf of Suez. Ominously, Sadat was now requesting military intervention by both the US and the Soviet Union to enforce the ceasefire in place. Increasingly irate notes now arrived from Brezhnev aimed at Kissinger, not Nixon. The notes alleged flagrant deceit on the part of Israel and echoed Sadat's demand for US and Soviet troops on the ground in Egypt. Sadat's request for military intervention had notably come in the form of a letter addressed to Nixon. Almost unnoticed, there had now been a major diplomatic breakthrough as we'd had no formal relations with Egypt for six years. Sadat's desperate situation called for desperate measures, and the U.S.-Soviet balance of power in the Middle East was clearly in play here. But something else was now taking place in Washington, which would dramatically impact what happened next. Eight impeachment resolutions had just been introduced in the House Judiciary Committee. Alexander Haig described Nixon to Kissinger as down, very down. Nixon was drinking. His very low tolerance for alcohol did not help his ability to focus. There had already been speculations that his hospitalization in July 1973 for two weeks had been for alcoholism, not pneumonia, as announced. There were unannounced middle-of-the-night phone calls by Nixon, slurred speech. It would be Kissinger, not Nixon, who would reply to both Sadat and Brezhnev at this critical juncture. 25,000 Egyptians were about to be entirely cut off. They could be starved to death, would undoubtedly try to break out. Nixon's judgment was now irrep irreparably impaired by an all-consuming paranoia. We were heading into the gravest foreign policy crisis of his administration. His equilibrium had been shattered by events which, like a deus ex machina, were hurtling him and his presidency irrevocably toward a tragic end. But his own image was now the card that trumped all others. A diplomatic climax of the Soviet Union was now at hand, and it couldn't wait for Nixon. The Soviets, fearful of losing face in the Middle East, now threw down the gauntlet. At 9.35 p.m. Washington time, 4.35 a.m. Moscow time, there came a message from Brezhnev through Dobrynin addressed to Nixon that would precipitate a nuclear confrontation akin to the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. It read in material part, quote, I will say it straight that if you find it impossible to act jointly in this matter, we should be faced with the necessity to urgently consider the question of taking appropriate steps unilaterally. Kissinger rightfully considered this one of the most serious challenges ever by a Soviet leader to an American president. He also knew that any appearance of Soviet troops on Egyptian soil 
would have the effect of drawing Egypt back into the Soviet orbit and that the Egyptians might never manage to leave it. Both he and Haig were convinced that burgeoning domestic crisis in Washington had emboldened the Soviets to act in the manner they had, a manner they never would have dared to act uh, like in the, in previously. The Kremlin knew full well that they were addressing a president facing imminent impeachment. Kissinger would have to make a move that shocked the Soviets uh, into abandoning their unilateral move. And he would have to make it now, that night, without our incapacitated chief executive. The Soviet threat was not just imagined. On the ground, the Soviets were now assembling their cargo planes to carry paratroops, not just military supplies to Egypt. The Soviets alerted seven of their 11 airborne divisions, also paratroop divisions. East German forces were in a state of increased readiness. 12 Soviet ships, including two amphibious vessels, were already in the Mediterranean steaming toward Alexandria. It's precious little time to call their bluff. Kissinger informed, Kissinger informed Dobrynin at 10.15 p.m. that we were calling a meeting to consider the matter, but that any unilateral action taken before we had a chance to reply would be very serious. His tone with his friend Dobrynin had now changed dramatically. This is a matter of great concern to us. Don't pressure us. I want to repeat again, Anatoly. Don't pressure us. Kissinger asked Haig to immediately assemble his six-member National Security Executive Group, dubbed WSAG. It was comparable to JFK's XCOM, but considerably smaller. Although Kissinger has not in his memoirs detailed Nixon's condition that night, historians have concluded that all the, all the evidence points to the fact that the president was loaded, that he was upstairs in bed inert, incapacitated. What is incontrovertible is that he was not at the meeting, even though at Hague's request, it was held at the White House to give the appearance of Nixon's presence. Nixon was not consulted during the meeting, that's clear. Not only did he play no part in the fateful decisions made there, he did not even um, see the Brezhnev letter uh, threatening unilateral action until the next morning. All those things are clear. We were effectively without a chief executive. Kissinger chaired the meeting, which took place from 10.40 p.m. to 2 a.m. in the basement offices of the White House. Present besides Kissinger and Haig were only four people, Admiral Moore, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, James Schlesinger, who was the Secretary of Defense, William Colby of the CIA, and General Brent Scowcroft, Kissinger's NSC deputy. At 11.41 p.m., Admiral Moore was directed to order military commands to increase readiness, variously to DEFCON 2 and 3. The Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean was already on DEFCON 2. The Soviets had to be made aware that we were prepared to go to war over this issue necessary, and DEFCONs 2 and 3 were forms of readiness that the Soviets would note. DEFCON 1, of course, is war. DEFCON 2 is a condition where an attack is imminent, and DEFCON 3 is the highest form of uh, alert in peacetime. A critical message to Sadat at 11.55 p.m. reiterated our objection to his request for military intervention, pointing out forcefully that should Soviet forces appear there, we, the U.S., would have to resist them on Egyptian soil. It also emphasized that this would not be a desirable outcome for Egypt. A forceful reply to Brezhnev was drafted but purposely delayed until 5.40 a.m. That would give the Soviets maximum time to pick up on American military movements on our DEFCON 2 and 3. Meanwhile, Kissinger warned Dobrynin through Scowcroft to advise Moscow to desist from all action until we received a reply from Egypt to our proposal that observers, not troops, be sent in. And not troops from the Soviet or the U.S., observers. Scowcroft was likewise directed to inform Dobrynin that any unilateral movement would have the most serious consequences. 
They may as well know, said Kissinger, that we mean business. Two can now play chicken. At 12.20 a.m., as both the nation and its president, Richard M. Nixon, slept, the Strategic Air Command SAC and the 82nd Airborne were on alert. The carriers, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Independence, and John F. Kennedy, all three, were on DEFCON 2, steaming in full speed toward Egypt. NATO and Europe was ordered to delay its planned return of troops, paratroops to the U.S. At 5.40 a.m., our reply to Brezhnev was finally delivered to Dobrynin, rejecting all Soviet demands and reiterating our request for a U.N. truce observer force. And then the physically and emotionally exhausted group of six, not unlike XCOM 11 years earlier, held its collective breath. We were again at the brink. A nuclear cataclysm might well erupt before day broke. Mercifully, the tide at last turned. At 8 a.m., Sadat backed off his request for military intervention by the two superpowers and agreed to Kissinger's proposal that a non-aligned international observer force, devoid of U.S. or Soviet troops, review the implementation of the ceasefire. The international crisis that might very well have ended in a nuclear holocaust formally ended instead at 1.10 p.m. As Sadat acquiesced to the Security Council resolution accepting an international observer force, excluding the U.S. and the Soviet Union, Soviet delegate Jacob Malik supported the resolution. The crisis quietly passed into history. In the end, we had faced down the Soviet Union in the midst of the most severe domestic crisis imaginable, the worst since the uh, Kennedy um, problem. As Alexander Haig surmised going into that determinative October 24th evening meeting at the White House, all you had to do was read the Soviet ultimatum and realize that we had World War III uh, in the making. Domestically, the crisis would only get worse, not better, with Nixon spiraling ever downward into Art Buckwald's quicksand and as Henry Kissinger and his shuttle diplomacy increasingly became the only ray of light, the only admired cog in a doomed administration. As Nixon descended ever further into the maelstrom, foreign policy became not just an end in itself, but a means of distracting the attention of the American public from the ever more shocking revelations of Watergate. But the strategy did not have the effect, not quite the effect Nixon uh, had hoped for. At one point when Nixon was reeling from the effects of Watergate while Kissinger was conducting shuttle diplomacy in the Middle East, Nixon's popularity was at its lowest ebb in the low 20s. Kissinger's was at 83%, by far the most popular figure in the government. On August 8, 1974, Richard Milhouse Nixon would become the first U.S. president to resign in disgrace after being impeached. In his various memoirs, Kissinger often speaks admiringly of Nixon's sharpness, particularly in times of crisis, including uh, times during the Yom Kippur War. At no time in those memoirs does he allege that Nixon was not available during that night of October 24th, yet it is now patently obvious from transcripts not released until 2004, from interviews, numerous interviews conducted by credible historians with others present and from objective evidence that that was indeed the case. So Israel escaped annihilation by a thread as a result of a Secretary of State with Metternichian foresight and cast iron fortitude under fire. As a result of the brash chutzpah of a patent-like Israeli recred who had assiduously studied the Nazi <coughs> von Manstein's military playbook and brazenly disobeyed orders and an ingenious genius balaclava-like entrapment of the Egyptian Third Army, <clears throat> also ironically modeled after the Nazi blitzkrieg in France during World War II. And all of this had taken place within a span of a little over two weeks. Perhaps Kissinger's Greek gods had been assuaged. 
and the arrogant Israeli leaders who were soon gone had been sufficiently chastised for their crime of hubris. But as Golda Meir correctly prophesied to Kissinger, Anwar Sadat would become a hero simply because he dared. Indeed, despite the decimation of his armies and the surrounding of the Third Army, Sadat Suez crossing on October 1973, October 6th, would therefore be celebrated, thereafter be celebrated as an Egyptian national holiday. Ultimately, the opening of diplomatic dialogue prompted by the crisis would lead Sadat to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Tragically, Sadat would be assassinated for his efforts as he watched just such an October 6th crossing celebration in Cairo on October 6, 1981, only eight years later. Whatever its faults, the unlikely Nixon-Kissinger alliance had wrought a tectonic shift in American foreign policy. Creative realpolitik, power balance diplomacy, borrowing much from the long forgotten Metternich, had succeeded in shifting our focus toward competition and cooperation with both Moscow and Beijing, and ultimately would incrementally refocus both of them more in the direction of status quo legitimacy than revolutionism. The policy would also bring about unholy alliances with military coups, which is that of August Pinochet in Chile, genocidal Yahya Khan in West Pakistan. Uh, but we were a far cry, a far cry from the idealistic intervention of Wilson with which we started this course. But domestically, the crisis had also illuminated a fault line in our 25th Amendment and a vulnerability in times of stress. When our chief executive was not physically disabled, but was manifestly unable to command during a nuclear flashpoint, there was no clear path to immediately removing him. It's a failing that could well come back to haunt us as the Oval Office continues to become ever more complex and our chief executives themselves become more tension-ridden more tension-ridden presidents in crisis, as were Wilson, Johnson, and Nixon. At this point, absent a more responsive constitutional amendment, we can only hope that if and when that occasion does arise, our leaders, whoever they are, are equal to that challenge. Oh, and as for Captain Ashkenazi and his wonder dog, Peng, well, they survived. And when the war ended, they both went back to studying philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. We last heard from, however, Peng the Wonder Dog still hadn't been awarded his degree. Thank you. Yes, Art. Wait for the mic. There was a, a period in the first couple of days uh, when things really looked very, very badly, and, and uh, the, the uh, request for missiles from the United States, uh, there was an awful lot of foot dragging yeah. uh, going on in Washington. There was. And you did have a situation where you almost had Israeli aircraft launched with nuclear weapons. Yeah, um, let, me, let me address the, the Maverick situation. That's what those missiles were called. The anti-attack missiles were called Mavericks. The opposition was from our Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger, a very interesting guy. Uh, born Jewish, incidentally, converted a Lutheran uh, and highly conflicted guy, especially with regard to Israel. And he very uh, forcefully opposed uh, both Nixon and Kissinger on sending the Mavericks to Israel. Nixon's reason and, and, uh, um, and, and Kissinger's reason was that they needed a balance in Israel. They didn't want Israel to wipe out Egypt, but they wanted Israel to survive. Uh, and that basically is also Metternichian. Uh, so essentially, Nixon and Kissinger essentially saved Israel. Would um, 
Golda Meir have resorted to Damona uh, to the nuclear, uh, nuclear missiles, nuclear weapons, had they had them and would they have been effective within that particular uh, milieu, Lord only knows. It's speculation. Uh, but Israel was certainly about its closest at that point ever to being, being annihilated. I can only you know, guess at that and be a wild guess and I don't have one. Uh, art, but you're absolutely right. Israel was very close to annihilation at that particular point. The odds were phenomenal, and um, there was some brilliant, uh, brilliant military tactics by the Israelis that allowed them to survive. And there were some marvelous moves made uh, uh, here in the United States, overcoming Schlesinger, uh, that uh, allowed them to be armed in such a way that they could survive. Uh, and new lines were drawn. And over a long, protracted period after that. Of course, uh, the first peace treaty in the area was negotiated by, uh, by Kissinger with shuttle diplomacy with Sadat. But you're absolutely right. They were close to, they might have become nuclear, God knows. I'm glad it didn't. Any other points, questions? It's been a great pleasure working with all of you. Uh, I've enjoyed being with you, and I hope you've enjoyed the course. Thank you very much. At OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock, and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact OLLI today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive.